Uh, welcome everyone to our series, Baked in Systemic Racism Around and Within Us. For today's talk, I am honored to introduce Lisa Nunn, Professor of Sociology at USD, who will be speaking to us about living in a bubble, white neighborhoods, white schools, white thinking. Professor Nunn was hired in 2009 at USD at right after her graduate education at UCSD. Her field is the sociology of education. In the 12 years she has been here, she has written four books. The first was Defining Student Success, The Role of School and Culture. The second was 33 Strategies for Faculty, a week by week resource for teaching first year or first generation students, which won an award last year from the American Sociological Association for 2020 scholarly contributions to teaching and learning. Her third book was a textbook on education and society and introduction to key issues in the sociology of education. And forthcoming this year, actually it's not forthcoming, it's two weeks ago, um, was published uh, College Belonging, How First Year and First Generation Students Navigate Pup Campus Life. She has also served as the president of the Sociology of Education Association for two years. Professor Nunn has taught courses in Christianity, Higher Education and Whiteness, an honors course in Education and Incarceration, and Introduction to Change Making, a minor she has long been devoted to. Every summer, she and Professor Mike Williams take USD students to uh, Malukeke Village in South Africa to do community engagement. Her abiding interest has been on the experience of first year students, where they come from, and how it affects their experience of college. She is now the director of the Center for Educational Excellence at USD. Please welcome. Lisa Nunn. Thank you. Thank you. That was really warm and quite flattering. I, I have to, um, honesty compels me to not take the credit for all of those wonderful things that you just listed off read. The textbook that you mentioned, I'm a co-editor. I did write one chapter and I love the way it sounded that I wrote that book, but I only helped edit it. Um, so I give, uh, give a little bit back there. And the course um, I taught on Christianity and higher education and whiteness was co-taught with Dr. Karen Teal. So um, she, I, just to be clear, she took the Christianity part. I took the higher education part and uh, we both took the whiteness part. Um, some of those ideas are part of what I'm going to be talking about today. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, all of you who showed up. Um, None of your cameras are on, but I'm looking at the names and this is a good looking crowd. This is a great bunch. Uh, I appreciate you spending an hour here today. There's Karen. Hi, thank you. The title is Living in a Bubble, White Neighborhoods, White Schools, White Thinking. And um, before I get any further, I want to just um, acknowledge that the land on which USD is located and where I am currently speaking from as well in my home in Linda Vista is the traditional and unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. I want to pay respect to the citizens of the Kumeyaay Nation, both past and present, their continuing relationship to their ancestral lands and acknowledge um, them before we begin. Um, with that, I'm a sociologist. So the way that I approach thinking about these things is to think about communities, think about the way that communities foster cultural ideas, the way that communities build institutions, societies build institutions that reinforce ideas, disseminate ideas. And this is how um, culture is, um, becomes this invisible, part of the atmosphere that we breathe every day without even recognizing it many times. Um, this is Emil Durkheim. He's one of the 
considered a classic theorist in sociology. And I just want to start with this insight that he offers that is very useful. We're born into a society that pre-exists us. We didn't create this mess. If we think it's a mess, we can be sure that we didn't create it. If we think it's a utopia, we can also be sure that we didn't create it. Um, we were born into a world that was already in motion, into a culture that had already decided a lot of things about who we are as a people, what we believe, how we behave, what our morals and values are, who we trust and don't trust. And that's not to say that cultures don't shift over time and change and that community it's not to say that communities are always stable and fixed and rigid but we didn't create the society that we learned how to be a member of and even as we may work to change cultural thinking and systems we have to be reminded that it is a slow moving beast, this kind of change, um, because it doesn't happen all at once. It doesn't happen in one lifetime. It doesn't happen with one person. Um, we're again, born into this ongoing pre-existing cultural world. And the part of that ongoing cultural world that I am talking about today is white neighborhoods. Um, we might know a lot about how neighborhoods were formally and informally segregated by race historically. And if you don't know this about today's neighborhoods, here are some facts for you. This is a 2020 Brookings report reminding us that as the quote on the, oh, you can see my cursor, as the quote over here in the blue box, um, reminds us even as metropolitan areas diversify, white Americans still live in mostly white neighborhoods. Um, so here's some, you know, fun facts over the last um, 20 years or so, right, data between 2014, 2018, um, being compared to 2000, neighborhoods, uh, oh sorry, these are metro populations, we're largely white, it's changed a little bit. The dark blue color represents white residents. And if we look at how that compares to neighborhoods of the average white resident, not a lot has changed, a little bit of shift, but overwhelmingly white. Neighborhoods of the average black resident are just right around 50%, a little bit declining over recent decades. Um, of being black, and, but the percentage of white folks in those neighborhoods has been pretty stable and pretty low, similar with neighborhoods where the, the average Latinx um, American lives. Pretty stable, pretty low percentages of whites, just under 50% um, Latinx folks. So we live in segregated neighborhoods, not entirely, right? None of these say 100% white and 0% black, but um, uh, continually, overwhelmingly, white folks live in predominantly white neighborhoods. Latinx folks and black folks live in neighborhoods that are overwhelmingly non-white. This is, this, is this is how neighborhoods look in the US. And I've just, I dropped this link in the chat for you just now. If you're interested, if, if you find this a little hard to believe or kind of feel like maybe you your favorite cities must not be fitting the mold, I invite you to explore around on Washington Post's really great interactive website. Take a look at your city, maybe the one where you grew up, maybe the one where you live now. Um, browse around and you can see a lot of detail, not just about how diverse that city or metropolitan area is how even within a very diverse city, the neighborhoods themselves are often quite segregated by race, even if the overall city is quite diverse. So have fun with that. I'm just giving you lots of data to convince you that um, this is true, even if it doesn't feel true, or even if we wish that it weren't true. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing for a sec here, and I'm going to invite you in to chat for a minute. Like, what, what does this mean that we 
we live in white neighborhoods. White people live in white neighborhoods. What, what's a white neighborhood? It's not just about white bodies being residents in the space. Please feel free to use the chat. Please feel free to raise your hand. Please feel free if there's a moment of silence to simply unmute yourself and step in. What makes a neighborhood feel white? What are some of the details? What is it that makes it feel that way? Yeah, thanks, Kristen, safe. I love that this feels a little bit puzzling or a little bit hard to answer. That's a big part of what I'm trying to say today in my talk. Good, there are good schools. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, it's white because of um, real estate decisions and guiding property values are higher. It's suburban, it's long-term tenants, great abundant resources like grocery stores and healthy food, the houses match, yes. An area with commonly white surroundings, good country clubs, golf courses, nice places to eat. Some of these things are based, are class, right, a consequence of socioeconomic class. Um, but class distinctions and racial distinctions go hand in hand in a lot of ways in American culture. Fred Robinson, I saw your hand up. Please chime in. Oh, I was trying to type in and chat. That's OK. Um, uh, I don't know this. I'll just throw this out. Um, you, when you don't see uh, people of color on the sidewalks, even walking through. Yeah, great. Great. And there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. It might not feel safe. It might not actually be safe. Um, they might not have a lot of reason to be there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Good, beautiful parks, decorative trees, there's constant construction and remodel and maintenance. Yeah, great. Good, thank you for this. Mm, Tracy, a neighborhood where colored people are watched. People of color are viewed as not belonging, be being outsiders, viewed with a suspicious eye because this is a neighborhood where those um, people who embody, or embody, who inhabit bodies of color, um, aren't commonly seen and, and also suspected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. So you don't have to share this, but just pause for a second and just think in your mind, what does a non-white neighborhood look like? What is a black, what makes a black neighborhood feel like a black neighborhood? What makes a Latinx neighborhood feel like a Latinx neighborhood? We don't have to share all this, but just see if you can come up in your mind with a contrast. Sometimes it's hard for white folks to be able to identify what is white about a place or a space or an environment that they have it. Um, and it's much easier to recognize for white folks, it's often much easier to recognize when they're in a space that's not white right? The music that's being played in the cafes might be different. Um, to, I think it was Karen's point, to Karen's point, the colors of paint on the houses might be vibrant, which is not a, a typical white neighborhood where HMOs, um, HMOs, haha, <laughs> HOAs, HOAs uh, often have elaborate rules on the 15 shades of beige that you are allowed to have your home painted and that's it, right? Very, we have very constrained um, house paint colors, just for an example. And um, yeah, part of what I'm driving at today, part of what I'm, I'm hoping that we, we chew on and think about is all the many ways that white culture, white thinking, white neighborhoods, white spaces, these places are culturally specific, but we are rarely encouraged to think about them as white. We're encouraged instead to think about them as normal, to see them as the default, the typical, the normal, and to see everything else as something different, something unique, something ethnic. I go to the grocery store and there's an aisle devoted to ethnic food. There's no aisle devoted to white food. The implicit 
message here is that the whole store is white people stuff. And if you're not white, you might find what you're looking for in this one aisle. And that's just one example, right, of all the many ways that growing up white, you're likely to grow up in a white neighborhood. Growing up white, you're likely to attend a white school. Growing up white, you're likely to be just entrenched in white thinking and never, ever, ever be asked to think about or to recognize all those environmental contexts as white, but instead to see them as normal, maybe even as American. And anything different from what's normal for you is different. Okay, so let me go back to share my slides just a little, just a little bit here. Thanks for the chat. I, I have no capacity. Some people are amazing at this. I have no capacity to both talk and um, really pay attention to the chat. So um, thank you. Please converse amongst yourselves in the chat the entire time. That's fine with me. But um, uh, I probably won't be able to, to notice or respond to much unless I'm explicitly taking a minute to look at the chat. So if it's a message for me, you might need to raise your hand. So white neighborhoods exist and white neighborhoods feel white. Now I'm going to switch to talk about um, schools. And oh, I wanna drop this link in the chat for you too. Give me a hot second here. I'd love for you to be able to play around with this while I am playing around with it as well in front of you. So there's that, and now let's go to the actual website. So um, just briefly, this map of the United States shows color-coded in purple places, school districts, these are districts, school districts that are diverse, school districts that are undiverse, in the blue and then in the light, light green, extremely undiverse. This is the Washington Post um, breakdown of categories. And you get some information on very particular schools, but let's just browse for a moment here. Let's take our local San Diego Unified. Wait, it was just coming up, Unified School. This is San Diego City, oh, that's what I was missing, the city. So here we are. Look at us, we can be super proud, we're purple right? Purple means diverse. We can feel good about that. In fact, it's telling us that we're historically diverse, not brand new diverse. We can maybe be proud of that too. There are other districts. Oh, am I going to be able to find one? Uh, I don't know. Newly diverse. That's the way they describe it. Newly diverse school districts as opposed to um, historically diverse. So this is a great website. It's really um, informative, help you sort through some of the um, hometowns uh, you might have lived in, schools you might have attended if you're curious. Um, so I'll just give you a second to kind of take a look at this information. What does it mean to be diverse in the San Diego City Unified School District? Well, it means that white students um, are currently around 24%. 90, 1995, they were, they were at about 31%. Black students have dropped in half over that time period from about 17% to 8%. Um, so there have been some changes, but it has remained diverse overall. Um, let's return to my slides. So I think this is great. We've got some diversity. If you look at the map of the US, we might not feel great about how much diversity um, there is across the entire nation. But I'm going to talk about yet another reason to not feel great about our diversity, um, not just San Diego City, but um, in general across the nation. Diverse schools and diverse school districts very, very often perpetuate racial inequities within the district and within the school. So even when we've met if it's a goal, which I think it should be, when we've met the goal of having diverse schools, we often fail to achieve racial equity in terms of the education that is being delivered to students from various racial groups. So I'm a sociologist of education. These are three of my favorite books on the topic. Um, 
I hope you find this useful. I'm happy to share my slides. Perhaps Lindy, Lindy will be able to send them out to everyone afterward, or if we have a moment at the end of the q and I can maybe drop them in the chat. Happy to share these slides if anyone's interested. Um, one of the ways that this happens, thanks, Lindy. She said yes. Um, slides will be coming. One of the mechanisms through which racial inequity continues, and almost always it's white students who reap the benefits of the best educational opportunities, even within a school or a school district that is diverse. Um, one of the dynamics, there are many, but I'm gonna talk about one, and it's what scholars call opportunity hoarding. And all three of these books talk about opportunity hoarding. I'm gonna give just one example here, one example of opportunity hoarding, and this is honors courses. We're talking about high schools, honors AP courses, or even middle school, actually. This book, despite the best intentions, interviews families in middle school as well as high schools. And one of the big findings from this book is that white middle-class families are, are more likely than families from other racial backgrounds to push their kids into honors and AP courses. And by that, I don't mean that they encourage their kids to work hard and to you know, earn a place in honors courses. I mean that they push their children into honors and AP courses, even when the child's test scores and teacher recommendations don't support it. They put up a fight. They call the principal. If they don't get their, if they don't feel satisfied with that, they go in and meet with the principal. They tend to be relentless and persistent and um, quite demanding in this respect. This happens also um, according to this research and others, but this is a great book on it. When the children themselves aren't really motivated. <clears throat> and this isn't without um, reason, right? There are real benefits to being in an honors course. Uh, here are three of the big ones. The best teachers tend to teach honors and AP classes in schools. In the same school, not every teacher is equally wonderful. The best teachers tend to be concentrated in um, the highest track classes. Also, the GPA often at many schools has an extra weight added to it, which helps you know, if I'm in English class and my next um, classmate over is in a different English class, but mine's honors, my GPA, we both get straight A's, my GPA might be a 4.2 and hers is a 4.0, right? And this um, uh, is part of strategizing for a sparkling college application a little later down the road. And if you follow this trajectory, you might even be able to save some money and save some time by, um, scoring well enough on an AP exam to earn college credit for it. So there are real tangible benefits. It's not, uh, the, the point is that white families more often feel entitled to have these benefits, even when the system tells them um, that their kid isn't qualified. So here's a, a long quote, but I'll let um, Amanda Lewis and John Diamond um, explain their findings a little bit in their own words. I'll read it out loud. I posted it here instead of just reading it directly to you because I like to read along. So if you like to read along, here you go, that's for you. Lewis and Diamond argue that white parents are not just passive recipients of structural advantages. They participate working to ensure that the rules, policies, and arrangements that are serving their children well do not change. Likely they do not do this out of animosity toward others, but out of a fierce interest in advocating for their own children. One response to this kind of opportunity hoarding would be to suggest that it's not fair to penalize or even criticize parents for loving their children so deeply and advocating for them strongly. The problem here is that such logic implies somehow that other parents do not love their children as much or that they just need to advocate better. In fact, the problem is not the extent of parental love, but the gaps in material, cultural, social, and symbolic resources that enable some to translate their care into more advantages for their children, practices that enable white middle-class parents who are working the system to pay off.
this kind of strategy, this kind of um, mechanism that leads to racial inequity, even inside of a diverse school or a diverse school district. Um, opportunity hoarding is just one of them, but it's also an example of, of white thinking. White folks, myself included, right? We are raised and grow up in and you know, come to breathe the cultural air of, um, uh, the cultural air that tells us that systems are in place to benefit us. Institutions exist to serve our needs. This is just, this is just normal. This, these are just facts. This is just the way the world works. This is how schools are organized. And if I know how to get something that I need out of the teacher, out of the principal, out of the curriculum, then of course I should do it. It just makes sense. Like the authors say here, this, this doesn't come out of animosity toward other people. This comes out of an understanding that I know how to secure an advantage for my kids. And of course I should do that. And that is a, a cornerstone approach to life that exists in white cultural thinking. Another cornerstone is this concept of concept, it's niceness. Um, so I'm drawing on a book here by Angelina Castagno, who writes this book, Educated in Whiteness. And she does a beautiful job laying out how this, um, how being nice is fundamental to being white. And um, so I'm, this is the second element of white thinking that I want to highlight today and we'll, we'll get to how that plays out in our lives here in a minute. But um, I think you already know this. I mean, you probably already know this, what the word nice means, but here's the concept, right? Being nice means that you're pleasant and agreeable and kind and polite and you don't make anyone upset. They're causing discomfort and conflict and controversy. These are things to avoid, maybe at any cost. Um, being nice also includes um, the practice of pointing out the good or the, pos the, the positive, the potential, glossing over or hiding or ignoring failures, shortcomings in the people around you, in the institutions we're a part of, emphasizing improvement or promise rather than failures, and just glossing over that ugly, awful stuff that we don't want to, that makes us uncomfortable and focusing on something nice instead. And also she argues niceness includes focusing on intentions rather than consequences of someone's behavior. So what she finds in her research on elementary schools is that placing a value on niceness as is inherent and abundant in white culture and white thinking, it, it makes things real complicated when it comes to race and understanding race and talking about race and thinking about race and wanting to change the world we live in for a more racially equitable future because niceness makes us want to be silent about race, not mention it at all, because mentioning it's uncomfortable. Maybe using code words instead of um, racial identities and really leaning often as possible to this idea, clinging to it, leaning on it, bringing it up at every possibility, this idea that race just doesn't matter. We don't need to talk about it. We, we don't need to say it out loud. We, we, it just, it doesn't matter. And if it doesn't matter, then we can overcome it. Um, of course, we know that it doesn't really work that way, but let's, let's take a moment and come back together. I'll stop sharing my screen here and try to think through some examples of what whiteness sounds like. This is partly me checking in with you. Do you know what the heck I'm talking about? Do you, do you, do, am I, where are we with this? What does whiteness sound like? What's an example?
Alex just dropped in the chat this podcast called Night Swipe Parents. Exactly. Talk about opportunity hoarding. It is a story that will knock your socks off from the 50s and 60s. Oh, good. Angelina, I don't get into politics. Let's not talk about politics. Um, I'm not political. The workplace shouldn't be a place where we talk politics. Great. That's, that's niceness coming through. I don't, let's not make this uncomfortable. Good, Susan. Yeah. Add to the list, politics and religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can't we all just get along? I treat everyone the same. These egalitarian claims that feel right. They, they resonate positively with us when we're engaged in niceness, when we prioritize niceness. I don't see color. I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. I didn't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. So of course there's nothing wrong with being nice, right? Nice is a good thing, it's a positive thing. But the point I'm trying to make and that Angelina Castagno makes is that when we anchor our approach to racial injustice in this cultural value of niceness, it gets in our way. It obscures the work, it obscures reality, and it obscures our ability to really understand how to work toward meaningful change. So let me, let me show you why a little bit. The chat's looking great. I'm sorry I can't comment uh, or respond to, so, uh, to each one of them. Um, let me just return to my slides here for a moment. Um, so, oh, rhetoric, just right now talking, I was ready to jump to the end of my slides, but I forgot, I have this one more piece that we're going to put into the conversation, and then we'll, we'll talk about how niceness in white institutions obscures the, the work of racial equity. So let's, let's flip just a, a minute here to think about higher education. So, Lots of scholars identify higher ed universities, colleges as white spaces that are just entrenched in white thinking. And here are some of the reasons why some of the um, ways that that's articulated. Um, we venerate history, we venerate tradition, and we are in a nation that was founded on white supremacy. So it is impossible or nearly not impossible, I would argue, but rare to honor and um, build statues and hang portraits on the walls of great historical figures that have meant something to our institution or to our nation without reifying white supremacist um, folks as well as policies, as well as laws, as well as histories. Our curriculum tends to reflect white Western forms of knowledge, norms of thinking. Even when we try to make our syllabi more inclusive and add more scholars of color, add more non-Western um, philosophies and, and approaches to our subjects, we're, e even as we try to do that, that's, that's even an acknowledgement, right? That we are starting from a very white place, a very Euro-centric, um, US-centric place, or at least North American-centric place. Um, so even as we change, rarely do we move to really switch over and beyond and outside of white thinking, white knowledge, white history, um, white curriculum. And then just the feeling of the place, right? Higher ed universities tend to be these places where the events that are put on for students, the food that is served, um, the clothes that are sold in the bookstore, all of this stuff reflect, we don't call it white, we call it mainstream, we call it American, we call it college age, but the cultural tastes 
of the white majority tend to be the cultural tastes that are reflected in the music and the fashion and the food and the fun and the, how, we, how we even design what we offer to students is often rooted in a white, a set of white sense cultural sensibilities. So let's build toward this together and I'll stop sharing so that we can talk, talk, talk amongst ourselves, see each other a little more if we want to, or at least see each other's names if we want to. Um, there are many ways that USD is a white space. I've been thinking about this a lot um, with, with my work, so I can think of a whole bunch of examples, but what comes to mind for you? These can be hard things to name if you haven't thought about it much, but what comes to mind for you? What are some elements, some details of USD that we can point to and say, yeah, that helps make it feel white, be a white institutional space? Yeah, Matthew just put in the chat being a traditional Catholic institution. Mm hmm. comes from a European starting point. Oh, good. The chat is um, populating with lots of great ideas. Yeah, Cynthia, few artifacts representing BIPOC artists and cultures. Instead, the default norm are artifacts celebrating and representing white cultures. Mm -hmm. Think about our architecture. From whence does it come? From whence? I don't even, I, I don't, I'm not even sure how, if I use that word correctly. From where? Um, decidedly not California, right? It comes from Europe, Spain in particular, if I'm not mistaken. Great. Yeah. Interestingly, it comes from Moorish Spain. Oh, well, okay. So I just learned something and maybe challenges my ideas a little bit, but at least more complicated. I appreciate that. I walk around campus. I, you know, the new aromas serves avocado toast. Feels real white to me. I, and I say that with like disdain in my voice. It, uh, we can we can have white culture around us. There's that's that's fine. I'm hoping for a place. Uh, my dream campus just has more than white culture. It's not that I'm looking for an absence of white culture in my my ideal world, but a campus that um, fosters. Um, a sense of honoring and recognizing and valuing a lot more than whiteness. And especially this idea, this sensibility that it's unnamed. We don't name it as white. We just name it as history. We just name it as tradition. Yeah, great. Okay, I'm loving the chat. I'm gonna go back to my slides here for a moment um, and wrap up the last couple of uh, points. So <clears throat> um, an important aspect of all of this is where I was heading to before, um, is how white culture's allegiance to niceness and how higher education, USD included, gives us sort of a white space as the backdrop for our um, educational experiences, um, it leads to it, it leads to some real problems in being able, uh, like I said before, being able to recognize how this work needs to get done if we really want to 
um, reach for racial equity. It obscures it, it, it creates problems. So one dynamic that um, I found in this book, College Belonging, as Fred um, anna uh, announced in my intro, um, it just came out as hot off the presses. And one of the important dynamics that I found, um, I, did the research on two different college campuses and I was interviewing first year students, but I followed them across their first two years. So with these many interviews, 186 interviews with first year students in their first two years um, on two different college campuses, I find this pattern with white students. Now, both of these campuses are predominantly white. One campus also, there is a very strong presence of Asian and Asian American students. So I count both of those as racial majorities. But um, what I find with racial majorities, so white and white and Asian at one of the campuses, is that these students overwhelmingly said that they value ethno-racial diversity. They really want to be a part of a student body at their college that includes people from different races. They really desire that. Different races, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different religions from themselves. So it's not that they're against diversity, they're all for it. In fact, they, they hunger for it, they deeply desire it. But when they taught, when white and majority, um, when racial majority students, white and white and Asian at one campus, when they talked about diversity, they described it differently than the students of color, the underrepresented students of color did on the campuses. When white students talked about it, they described this kind of ideal for ethno-racial diversity where non-white students just kind of blend themselves in to the flow of campus life without making any kind of fuss, without calling any attention to it, they just blend themselves in. And many white students saw it as the task, the job, the responsibility of students of color to do that work to integrate themselves, fuse, mix, coexist, mingle. These are all words that students used in interviews with me. It was their job to mix in and integrate and mingle and coexist. Not my job as a white person to do anything. My job is just to be here and hang out in call, at college. But never acknowledging, never realizing, never recognizing that college is a white cultural space, a white institutional space. So of course I feel comfortable, not of course, but I'm much more likely to feel comfortable here. So not recognizing at all um, the, the rub there. So again, white students saw it as the task, the burden of non-white students to blend in. And they thought that they should be doing that. They should be blending in without making anyone feel uncomfortable about it. There was a lot of niceness built in to the way that they talked about students from other racial and ethnic groups. And so in the book, I call this a desire for nice diversity, drawing on Angelina Castagno, as I um, introduced before. And um, this leads white students, majority, uh, racial majority students, to be really frustrated and irritated and kind of rubbed the wrong way anytime that students on their campus would join groups or organizations or centers that um, uh, were sort of tied to a racial identity. So um, at one of my campuses, there is this uh, really popular resource center. It was called the Latino Chicano Resource Center. And the students all called it Latichi, Latino Chicano Resource Center. They called it Latichi, they loved it. It was this wonderfully, wonderful place that was really meeting a lot of needs for the Latinx students that I interviewed on this campus. And um, white students on that campus really didn't like that place. They thought they, they, it's divisive to them to be, they call it, one student called it huddling off. The way that um, uh, different groups, as he said, different groups will huddle off together, like at Latici. And 
white students just really couldn't, they, it's just not nice to be excluding other people. It's divisive and frustrating. And um, this is the sentiment that white students had about it, not really, yeah, not really understanding at all how um, students like themselves wouldn't need a, a club or a space or a, a center to be a part of in the same way that non-white students might. And so on these same two campuses, I really found that students of color, right, underrepresented students of color, they felt, they perceived quite accurately a sense of distrust from ethno-racial majority students, white students mainly around campus. They felt like, um, they felt like they didn't belong. Walking, just walking around campus, as I describe in the book, there are multiple realms of belonging that students talk about, and there, one of them is a sense of campus community belonging that I describe. And students of color on these campuses describe just not feeling welcome, not feeling accepted, not feeling wanted as they navigated around their college campuses. And um, I, I don't think they're mistaken. After talking to white students, I understand this sense of distrust. It, it's real. Um, so as we move into the last um, bit of time together, I'm happy to talk about any part of this that you would like to discuss more. But I'm also really interested in spending time together thinking about what is it that we can envision changing that would just make our own campus less of a white institutional space, less grounded in white thinking, more of a place that validates and honors and recognizes non-whiteness, right? Cultural modes of thinking, histories, um, forms of knowledge. My slides are over. I leave us with this. Any kind of Q&A that is on your mind or also, um, yeah, a conversation about what, what can we do right here at home? This is, a, it is more of an institutional take on that, mm -hmm. that um, uh, what we really could use and, we, and what we have needed in the 30 years I've been here um, is to have scholarships for people of color, mm -hmm. students of color, to have more of them on campus, to give them scholarships uh, and have them here and that very presence uh, would change things. Thank you for that. Um, I can also say for my interviews with students, particularly first generation students, when they're offered a generous financial aid package, including scholarships, they really took that as a sign that the university wanted them. Yeah. It was very, it was very validating for those students. So there, there are multiple layers to what you're describing that I think are, is meaningful. I'm actually a part of a group that is trying to form scholarships for to bring uh, undergraduate researchers into our field. And my question is in regard to what things should we be thinking about when we're forming those scholarships? Um, as far as sending the scholarships out, making sure that, you know, making sure that what can we do to try to avoid some of these pitfalls of, you know, here's, here's some money, but now you're going to walk into an organization, into an organization that where you don't feel welcome. And you're, you know, if you're in our case, you're doing undergraduate research, but you actually don't get a chance to get the job when you get there, you don't get the chance to speak in the classroom, you know, you know, whatever that might be. How, how can you link those two things together? Yes, exactly. Bringing people, getting people to campus, helping them, helping alleviate some of the financial stress of being on campus. Um, that is just step one, right? Because that, that's not gonna do it. And we, we can't put the burden on those folks to 
show up and change our institution, right? We have to do a lot of work to be a place that um, validates and supports and pushes into not just success, but thriving students of color. And we're, we're not entirely, we're, we're not there. I don't need to be so optimistic. I don't need to be so nice. That was my impulse to be nice right there. We're not entirely there. No, we're barely, we're barely even st starting that journey. But that's exactly right. We need faculty to be better at this in our classes. We need, um, I speak for fact, I speak about faculty because I am one and that's the first place my mind goes, right? Like we, that's, that's the wheelhouse I know best, but in every facet of institutional life at USD, we need to be better at being a place where students of color want to be, feel supported, thrive. Um, I wanted to say that um, I think, so I'm faculty in the theology department and um, I teach a class regularly on racial justice. That's the name of the class. The last time I taught it, especially I had like most of the students in the class who identified as white by the end were saying, why are we only getting this as juniors and seniors? Everyone should have to take this their first semester at USD. And so even from the white students, there was sort of this, this organic desire to have known earlier, to have more education around the history of our country and the educational system and of, in my class, it's theologies who talk about the Catholic Church as well. Um, but we need to figure out how to do a better job of, not just of, of um, initiatives to try to get students of color to feel more welcome, but to educate the white students around cultural issues, around how to, you know, like the dynamics we were talking about, Dr. Nunn, about not trusting the students of color who go to the solidarity spaces because they need them, right? I get chances in my classes to help my students understand why those spaces are needed. And once they understand it, they're all for it. Um, one, of my, one of my students who identified as white actually for his final project proposed that USD should, I don't think this is practical, but he said, we all have an academic advisor. We should all have an, a diversity advisor where we each of us have to meet with, with a faculty member regularly who can help us understand these issues and how to be better people. And it was, it was really um, amazing to hear him sort of advocating for that. But yeah, I think we need to figure out, I don't know if it's, if we can start an orientation even, or somehow before they even arrive on campus, but what can we do to help our white students become better citizens of the campus as well? I think that's exactly right, right? Um, targeting um, efforts towards students of color is only one piece of the equation. We also have to like, what's the word for unsteeping the rest of us in um, white thinking and white, that that habit that we have of just glossing over things that are uncomfortable or back in history that we're not very proud of culturally and allowing ourselves to imagine and pretend that if we are just good people right now today, then everything's gonna be fine, right? We need to disabuse our white students of that as much as we need to do anything else for the students of color. I totally agree. Thanks for that. About this niceness thing. Um, <clears throat> When I was just thinking of reading uh, to, in today's newspaper about what's happening out at Ladera Ranch, uh, where an Asian family that moved in is having people um, harass them on a, on a on an hourly basis uh, because of the uh, the Chinese um, uh, uh, the the Chinese flu that we're all suffering from, and I, I'm just wondering about this niceness of. of when, what happens in these neighborhoods where whiteness so easily transforms into ugliness? Mm. Yeah, right. This idea that both of things exist at the same time in the white cultural sphere, this prizing of niceness and also, also this willingness to be just unabashedly um, white supremacist. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's like a trajectory for, for one single person from niceness to this willingness to tell a new neighbor to go home, go home. Um, but the, the reality is there, right? That white culture has space for both of those things. 
I was just wondering how if, if, if niceness easily translate easily uh, 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 transforms into ugliness. Yeah. If there's something about the niceness in the first place. Well, so <laughs> on that note, like this is the connection that I've been trying to um, articulate just briefly here. Uh, so my work's on college campuses, so I'll just return back to that same example, but I, I am making the argument that this niceness allows, gives permission for white students to be super frustrated and angry when those other people aren't being nice. They're joining their little exclusive clubs and I'm not allowed in and the, why, if I did that, everyone would be pissed. But look at them over there, they're doing that. I'm being exaggeratory, no one quite uh, represented that viewpoint so vehemently in an interview. But that's this, this feeling, this, this frustration like, and this sense that being angry is an appropriate response to someone who is making me feel excluded without, without any um, sense of putting the larger context together that people, students, fellow students might be joining such groups in response to the overwhelming white thinking and white culture on campus. So yeah, if, if I articulated that well enough, clearly enough, I do see a tie there. Um, allegiance to niceness justifies anger when you see someone else just refusing to play by your rules. Because you think your rules are everyone's rules. You believe that they should be. I'm a member of Immaculata. Okay. And um, we have started a, um, um, I'm part of a committee, the racial, social justice committee and we've been reading white fragility uh, right now i'm still here black dignity in a world made for whiteness but my question is this is how can the immaculata as part of the usd campus physically help how can the catholic church help the campus has that ever been thought of i mean i've been attending immaculata for five years i wish I wish that we, I could see young students coming there. And we're really working on racial diversity. We're, we're gonna move ahead with it. I don't know if it's something that's relevant to, to what you do, but I feel like I'm part of that campus even though I'm not part of the campus. Well, I hope that others will chime in here a little bit. I, I don't feel like I can speak directly to the Immaculata and its goings on and what might change. But here's the one thing that comes to mind for me as I was crafting this talk, I was thinking, okay, what, what suggestions would I have for just changing just the, the feeling of the space at USD? And here's one idea. I work in um, what was formerly known as Sarah Hall, right? It's now saying it's Tecaquitha and Sarah Hall. But no one can pronounce Tecaquitha. Everyone's terrified of it. So we call it Saints. So we did all this work to rename Sarah Hall. And now no one names it. No, no one, not no one. Few of us are actually able to even honor that change with our mouths. Um, so, OK, that wasn't really a suggestion for you. Um, but I'm t thinking about my own building, and I'm thinking about the hallway. I'm on the third, the sociology department's on the third floor. And I just think, what if we took down the beautiful paintings of white donors and put up instead images of something else that might be deeply connected to our Catholic identity? or some other aspect that USD wants to um, highlight, but images that just don't reinforce this overwhelming sense of whiteness. So one idea that came to me is, what if there was a huge, huge map of the world and it's color coded by country or maybe even pieces of countries according to um, Catholic populations. As I learned from Dr. Teal in a class that we co-taught um, a lot, uh, uh, there has been a great change um, over time in, oh, you may have to take over Karen, but um, in the Catholicity, the Catholicity of um, Latin America. And, you know, what if we just, I don't know, we just put up some things that speak to um, elements of 
our tradition and history that we're proud of that don't look that don't reinforce whiteness? Can, how many can we find? What can we do? How about black saints? Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of those. And Asian saints. I've I've complained in our in the parrot in the church. If you go inside there, a lot of those saints look awfully white, and I knew they weren't white. I'm talking about the statues. And the pastor there sort of gives me this funny look. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're working on it. Yeah, no, exactly, right? All these elements from the, the physical pieces of the um, decorations on the walls to the things that we talk about to being willing to go on YouTube and spend four minutes learning how to pronounce Tecacuita. It doesn't take that long, but we no one asks us to do it. Except me, I force my students to do it in class, but uh, you know, for many of them, that's the first time they've ever tried to say it out loud. Just when I mentioned the, the Moorish thing in, in Spain, or even the avocado, which is a Mexican fruit, um, uh, it, that, that whiteness or the creation of whiteness uh, is, is, uh, involves a lot of whitewashing. <laughs> In other words, that there are things that come to us, especially through the foods that we eat, that are uh, entirely not white. And yet we will take them and somehow uh, whitewash them and make them a part of our daily life. And so therefore they become white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and it's not essential in some way. It is in some ways, and in other ways, it is is produced. Mm -hmm. No, I think there's a lot there, and in some ways, I I like to imagine this mixing and mingling, and what's the contemporary term for it? Food fusion, right? That this is a sign of a cosmopolitan, much you know, um, approach to um, living and and cohabitating the same space with different cultures. So in some ways it could be, it could be a sign of something wonderful if we've um, experienced food fusion. But when I think about some of the foods that we have adopted um, and made white, I don't feel like it's this harmonious sharing of, um, cultural appetites that's happening. It feels like a power dynamic. Thank you, this is delicious and now it's ours. Mm -hmm. And we will do with it as we please. Can you explain to me how white niceness plays a role in systemic racism? Additionally, I'm not sure I fully understand what you mean by white niceness. So um, going back to that slide where Angelina Castagno, where I quote Angelina Castagno laying out all of these elements of what it means to be nice, the argument she makes that I'm propagating here is that um, being nice is a, a cornerstone of white culture. So to grow up in to navigate white culture even as an adult means that you have learned this sensibility to value and prize being nice, being polite, not making people feel uncomfortable. Don't discuss that. Don't talk about that. Don't bring that up because it might make someone feel bad. It might, it, it might be a little icky. And to avoid discomfort, she argues, is part of being nice and being white. Um, folks who participate in white culture, you don't even have to be white to participate in white culture. But if you participate in white culture, you have learned that it's important and valuable and wonderful and the sign of a good person if you are nice. So the way that this plays a role in systemic racism that I'm arguing here, and Castagno does a beautiful job of in her book on schools, is that this desire to be nice leads us to obscure racial injustices. In fact, not to even mention race at all because somehow even saying black out loud is racist. Like there's just the, all this discomfort with naming race to start with and to identifying that white people get more at this school and Latinx people get less at this school, that that's awful. And, and so we start to talk about it in a different way. We use code words. We, we gloss over the racial component and instead talk about 
students from active families and students from inactive families, whether or not that even maps on to the real disparity, but these code words start to be used that feel safer. And so the idea is that systems can't, institutions can't, schools can't really address the racial injustices that are happening unless we name them, identify them, and work to solve them. So this niceness gets in the way. And maybe I said that only as confusingly as I did before, and you aren't any clearer, Alex, but I hope that helps a bit. And I am a teacher at a middle school, and I'm a USD alum. Um, I think a lot about my role as a white woman in the education space, and I did Teach for America. And so I'm thinking about like the role of niceness within colleges and how that then lends themselves to public education and schools. Um, I'm wondering what you think about organizations like Teach for America or City Year or other AmeriCorps programs um, that sometimes perpetuate this problematic niceness. Yeah, I was a member of the Peace Corps immediately after college and the Peace Corps has some similar, so when I critique Teach for America, I'm critiquing myself and my own experience back in the 90s, which I'm sure is still similar with what the Peace Corps is up to today and Teach for America up to today. I, I think that you are right on that organizations like these perpetuate some of these problems. Um, I also think there's some real benefit to Teach for America and the Peace Corps and AmeriCorps and um, similar groups. But let's focus on the part that we're talking about. Um, it absolutely fosters an, a, a value and appreciation for a white savior mentality. And not everyone who joins is white, certainly, but we know the demographics is overwhelmingly female and overwhelmingly white, um, as is actually our teaching force, um, overwhelmingly female, overwhelmingly white. And so when we have teachers, not just Teach for America teachers, but teachers in general, um, uh, in classrooms, right, and in schools where there is not racial affinity with their students, that's a drawback. It's not a deal breaker. And you can be great and overcome that. And especially if you're working hard and being intentional and thinking through all of these things, but it's a lot of work that is on the shoulders of the teachers and the Teach for America participants in order to really be thoughtful and intentional about the way that racial dynamics um, affect the, the power dynamic in the classroom and the bigger, like you're pointing to, I think, the bigger cultural message about sending um, myself, a young white woman to a foreign country to go, I was untrained and I walked in the door to teach school because me, American white woman, not all of us were white, but American white woman is gonna come in and solve your problems in your school in Latvia. And I didn't, I didn't even have training. I wasn't even a teacher, but somehow they were supposed to like, Thank you, thank you for coming here. And, and so I'm being a little facetious right there. There's also some really great stuff that happened, but um, I think part of the problem is that I was never asked to acknowledge that. I wasn't even asked to, real, to think about it or to recognize it. Um, I learned through some really hard conversations with the community that I was placed in that they didn't think it was all that amazing that some 22 year old walked in their door to rescue them. Um, so as much as Teach for America and Peace Corps can require their volunteers to think through this and to sit with it hard and to have some strategies for mitigating it, as much as they can do that, the better. Another concern is that Teach for America works so closely with charter schools and I know that charter schools in and of themselves um, perpetuate segregation within communities. And so even on the basic like policy level, um, these programs, yeah, can cause harm. <laughs> even while they're doing good, they can also cause harm, right? It's, it's not one or the other. So I was thinking about whiteness, but from kind of a national, like a national identity perspective. So I live in East County. We have a lot of, Middle Eastern immigrant national, like nationally 
Arabic speaking from different countries, but the US census has categorized them as white. And I know that there's been some movement to redesign the census to create a new category. And I'm just wondering when you have groups of people that are lumped into American whiteness that don't have that experience, how that might play out in schools. That's a great question. So um, my sense of this, and maybe if I read for a while, I would have a more nuanced and complicated answer for you. But my sense of this is that um, being marked as white on federal forms doesn't necessarily translate in a meaningful way to your school experience. You might be at a school where um, people who feel culturally white tr treat you as other. And you might also identify at really as other than, than culturally white. So you're, you're still in practice uh, an ethnic minority. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would think that's true. And, and what I was thinking about is like federal funding dollars. So if you are in a school district that is coded as white and affluent, I don't know, I'm just thinking like demographically, if, if there's support systems, if they do feel different, but there's no programming for that. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And my guess is, yeah, there's just no programming for that because it's, it's um, under a veil, it's obscured in the in the data points. Um, yeah, that's that's really fascinating. You're reminding me of a, a um, somewhat similar dynamic that I found in my research study. And that is that several, not a huge number, but a, a sizable, like a fair number of the students that I interviewed identified themselves as culturally white, saying things like I was raised white, I'm, I'm white, but um, actually my grandmother's from Mexico, so I'm Latina. So on a form, I'll click Latina, but I don't, I don't live, they have a bunch of different ways of phrasing it, right? I don't live that way. I wasn't raised that way. I was raised very white. I feel very white. Um, really, really I'm white, but I, so these forms are really complicating our understanding of what, like you're saying uh, in a different context, what student bodies look like, what student bodies are actually like. And, um, there's lots of good reasons to not use these stupid categories that we have in existence. Um, mm -hmm, they cause problems. They cause misunderstandings, misperceptions of who, who it is that we have in this school or in this place. As I'm sitting here thinking, I'm, I'm thinking of a uh, talk that took place a while ago about job descriptions and how when you're trying to hire into an organization, how um, you need to be thoughtful about how you describe the job in your job description to be more inclusive of, in, in this case, what I had read about was gender, um, you know, to be able to be more inclusive of women who might be interested in working for your organization. What I'm thinking about formulating things such as scholarships. Um, I'm assuming there are somewhere. Are there resources that we as the, the predominantly white organization can go to as, as a guide for making sure that we're doing it right? Right's probably the wrong word, but. I do, uh, I'll have to dig it up and I'm not going to get all of the author's names, but um, it's Mark Johnson. Guerrero, co-authors. Anyway, there's um, there's some great resources that I know of, uh, uh, guidelines for creating, I think he calls them culturally inclusive campuses. And some of it is really anchored on, this is what made me think of it, exactly this piece about identities and letting students name themselves in the way that they name themselves and then recognizing um, you know, who they are and what that means from, from that point, rather than trying to slot them into the categories that we already have ideas about and then approaching the work based on the ideas we have about these categories that we've sort of arbitrarily shoved people into. So I don't know how much that connects with exactly your work, but Tracy, please send me an email if I don't remember and follow up and I'll send you a couple of articles and links at least that might get the, some ideas churning even if it doesn't hit your, your work exactly. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for this stimulating talk. And um, thanks again. <laughs>